Sorry about that. Jump the gun. All right, it looks like everyone's out of the waiting room now. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Scriptorium 2.0 stakeholder meeting. I'm Emma Thompson. I'm the project manager for our year-long planning grant. Um, I just have a few housekeeping things to mention before we get started today. We are recording this meeting and it will be posted publicly at a later date once we get um, a transcript produced. And there is live transcript available for this meeting if you would like it. Um, we are also hoping for a lot of good discussion today. So um, please feel free to post your questions in the chat during the presentations as you think of questions. And Lisa Fagan Davis has generously offered to moderate the chat for us. And we'll also open up the floor to questions after each presentation. We've also scheduled about 30 minutes at the very end of the meeting for a final discussion. And we will also be distributing an exit survey afterwards to all of you um, to um, get more feedback about our plans. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Deborah Cashin, the Executive Director of DS. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Deborah Cashin. I'm President and Executive Director of Digital Scriptorium. I have been for almost six years. This is my last year as president. It's been a, a wonderful um, experience to work with everyone involved with DS in the last six years. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, especially uh, many of you were at our um, meetings in October. Um, so you know what our meetings are about. They're about what we call DS 2.0, which is the, the project to uh, bring uh, the database and catalog of Digital Scriptorium into the digital present, if not future. Um, we had four meetings in October where we opened discussions to um, our peers and many of you to help us consider the future of the DS database to make it more inclusive and more accessible for institutions to join, as well as for use researchers to use. And since then, the DS board has been, and the uh, steering committee we've appointed, and um, our project um, uh, investigator, Lynn Ransom, and our project manager, Emma Thompson, who you just met at Penn, plus uh, 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 more staff um, and people at Penn have uh, been uh, working and collaborating with DS um, to fulfill the, uh, the expectations of the grant we received from the Institute of Museum and Library Services last year um, to plan where we think and build a roadmap basically in a data model um, for DS 2.0. And we're, we're really grateful for all of you who have been so supportive and dedicated to this project. And I especially wanna um, acknowledge uh, Sean Quimby at Penn, who is now the Associate University Librarian there for Special Collections, who has also came in just, uh, just last year, very new, um, just recently, and immediately um, embraced uh, the efforts of, of this project and has been supporting DS uh, very generously, uh, both in, in terms of his time and attention. Uh, so I wanted to thank Sean, um, and especially Lynn and Emma for just directing and driving this project. Um, I don't wanna take a lot of time. Um, I, Lynn and uh, Emma are gonna direct this meeting and we wanna, we wanna do it in two hours. Um, um, and so I'm gonna turn the meeting over to them now. I just wanna again say thanks to everybody for coming. And um, if you have questions and uh, put them in the chat, direct them to Emma, Emma's managing the meeting. So thank you very much for coming. I'll direct it back to uh, uh, my dear friend and colleague, Lynn Ransom. Thanks, Deborah. And before I begin, Emma, uh, Doug Emery needs some help getting into the meeting. Can you be, he's texting me right now. And I'm otherwise occupied. Um, thank you everybody for coming to this. It's nice to see uh, so many return faces from the October meetings and some new faces. So today we're holding our second stakeholder meeting um, to, and the purpose of this meeting, like Deborah said, is to present the data model and the workflow for your 
response. We want to we want to hear what you have to say about it. Um, I want to give a little bit of an update on our progress because it's changed. So what you're looking at is the original work plan that we submitted um, to the IMLS for the planning grant, the National uh, Leadership for Libraries grant. Um, and we are in month nine of this grant and we're, which that's puts us three quarters of the way through. And in the original proposal, what we had intended to do was just at, by the end of the grant cycle, have a data model design and a, and a plan finalized. Um, if everyone is happy with what we tell you today, we are sort of at that point now. Um, I do wanna direct your attention just to make sure that everyone knows that the, these things are available. Uh, Emma did a wonderful job with the current data content assessment that we uh, put up in, in the second month and the environmental scan that looks at, uh, you know, what's happening now and around the world in terms of similar projects. Um, so there's a, I'll have a link in the next slide to that um, that I recommend you taking a look if you haven't seen them already. So, so we're at month nine now and what we're hoping to do uh, in the next three months is based on your responses again, um, test a prototype, right? To, to implement a prototype, put a little test data in uh, to see what happens. And so we're really excited to be able to be at this point now rather than in July, because that means in August we can switch gears and start uh, on the next stage of development. Um, we are adding, so this is kind of a revised work plan and the purple are the changes. So we added a second, we added this meeting. We originally only were gonna have two, one at the beginning, one at the end. And so this is the uh, addition to give you the update now. And we will be holding a meeting uh, in July, uh, hopefully to show you the results of our prototype testing. And here's the link to the DS 2.0 page if you wanna to get to the uh, reports Emma's posted and the scan, the environmental scan and the data content assessment and other links such as to our YouTube channel where I think we'll be posting a video of this presentation. So just to give you a brief overview of the agenda, um, we're not gonna be super strict about time. Uh, I don't know if in the email it's sent out uh, time a more specific timeline, but I think we want this to be a kind of informal and relaxed discussion. But I'm going to start with an overview of the vision for DS 2.0 and then transition to Emma talking about the data model explanation and a wiki based intro. And then in the second hour, we will, Emma will continue talking about the workflow and what that means to members. And then I'll follow up with an implementation plan and our timeline and plans for further funding, then what's you know, generally what's gonna happen next, assuming all of this goes according to the plan. I wanna first uh, just acknowledge the uh, number of people who have uh, participated already in the planning grant. Uh, this is the project team. So Emma, myself, Doug Emery, and Miko Koho, who, is Miko able to join us today? Emma, is he on the? Yeah, so I think it's a very important festive holiday in Finland right now where Miko is, and it's Friday night, so we told him, we gave him a pass on this meeting, but he's been uh, instrumental in the helping us with the design of the data. Um, so all of us on the project team participated in this project mapping manuscript migrations, which was a, a transatlantic platform digging into data challenge project. And we completed it in 2019. And the point of this project was to combine three data sets. It was kind of a you know, proof of concept for combining distinct data sets into a linked open data environment. And the work of this project really underlies our approach to DS 2.0 in terms of taking separate and independent uh, and living data sets, you know, data sets that are still being worked on and added to and putting them in a, you know, federated space so that you can search across these data sets. And then this data is made available um, in RDF to the world for free. And so 
I just want to acknowledge uh, the work of that project in terms of supporting this project. We have a wonderful steering committee composed of Deborah Cashin, Ray Clemens, Lisa Fagan Davis, Tamar Evangelistia Doherty, who has recently joined, and Liz Hebert, who um, is working on the peripheral, who's the principal investigator of the um, peripheral manuscripts project, the Clear Funded project that is seeking to digitize and bring to the world a number of manuscript collections in the Midwest. We've also uh, managed to hook in um, more people from Penn to, who have been contributing to weekly meetings that we have about the technical development of the S2.0. And uh, this has been a wonderful surprise uh, to get this interest from our colleagues. Jim Hahn, uh, who's head of metadata research at Penn Libraries, Amy Hutchins, the manuscript cataloging librarian who knows all about our manuscripts and all about manuscript description processes. And John Mark Ockelbloom, the digital library strategist and metadata architect. And Kelly Tuttle, who is a former project cataloger for the manuscripts of the Muslim world. She's no longer at Penn. She took another <clears throat> position recently, but she has been instrumental in like, making us really think about how uh, you know, our sort of traditional uh, practices of manuscript description need to be sort of updated to be more inclusive of other manuscript cultures. And last but not least, um, my relatively new boss, who I have not yet met in person, Sean Quimby, um, has been a huge support and a real advocate in the libraries for the work that we're doing. And so we're really glad to have him on our team. And I also wanna just mention the board of directors which uh, Deborah and I are members. Um, everyone has been really supportive. We've been working on uh, ES 2.0 since 2015. Um, and it's uh, taken up a lot of everybody's time, but it's a real, I think, a real lab labor of love for everyone. And also the members of the advisory council that's chaired by Lisa Fagan Davis and uh, also has Ray Clements and Consuelo Dutchke, Barbara Shaler. And Bill Stoneman, who, you know, I've been, as everyone knows, been involved in the formation of Digital Scriptorium, who were the founders of Digital Scriptorium. And uh, it's to them that we owe a lot of the inspiration of the work that we do today and that we hope to carry on into the future. So, <clears throat> excuse me, clear my throat, it's allergy season, so I get to cough a lot. So moving on, like I mentioned, the, the board has been, <clears throat> excuse me, has been working on DS 2.0 now since 2015. And we've been thinking about what needs to happen to digital scriptorium uh, in order to ensure its future. Um, some of the work that we've done, that Deborah did, is uh, turn DS Digital Scriptorium into a 501c3. We adapted bylaws uh, to strengthen our governance structures. Um, and then we have also been you know, faced with the challenge of what happens to the next generation of Digital Scriptorium. Many of you may know that uh, Digital Scriptorium is currently hosted at Berkeley under the uh, guidance and um, great support of Lynn Grigsby. But Berkeley is moving to a, a new digital library architecture that will no longer support WebGen DB, which is what the current database is in now. Um, and so we have, they've graciously uh, allowed us to keep it running for the next couple of years, but pretty soon, um, they're not going to be able to support it. And so there's this really urgent need to come up with a solution for what's next. We also um, you know, have been listening to our membership and uh, held a planning meeting in February 2019 at the Beinecke Library to bring stakeholders together, members together, to talk about um, what uh, what we needed to do, what did our members want from us? What would make their lives easier? Um, 
So in addition to you know, challenges like losing the technical support for digital scriptorium, some of the challenges that members face is the difficulty of adding or updating the data in its current form. Um, many small institutions um, can't meet the requirements for images uh, and description standards. Uh, and also many institutions just don't have the expertise to have medievalists or manuscript researchers come in and describe their manuscripts. So there was this like impending sense of uh, unsustainability that we needed to address. So this planning meeting was a, a way to sort of brainstorm about the things that we wanted DS 2.0 to be. And we came up as a result of that meeting with this list of um, objectives that ultimately became the basis for the planning grant that uh, the IMLS planning grant that, that we uh, are now using for this, this period of planning. So one of the first ones was to be, uh, to, you know, sort of to expand our scope and to be a national uh, union catalog for all pre-modern manuscripts in North America. And by all, we mean not just European. We wanted to expand our scope in that way. Another objective was to provide a low barrier to both the contribution and use of metadata and images for pre-modern manuscripts from all manuscript cultures. So just to make it easy to get the data in there. We want to build upon a clear and adaptable and scalable data model so that we're not in this position that we're in now, at least for a long time. And we want it to employ linked and linkable data to make our manuscripts as available as, you know, as best we can to the world and to link to authorities um, such as VIA or GeoNames and make that data work a little bit harder for us as manuscript researchers. We also want, to want it to support interoperability with other manuscript research projects at a regional, national, and international level and enable content con <clears throat> for contributors to maintain management and ownership of the data while sharing in the continuing benefits of national collaboration. And this point, um, I'll, I'll explain in more detail in a bit. <clears throat> I don't know if it's raining or if that's pollen that's falling from the sky outside my house. It could be a mixture of both nasty times. <clears throat> so as we as we moved forward with the planning grant and we started meeting and you know last fall started thinking about uh, how we're going to meet these objectives, we came up with this list of principles that have been guiding our data model development. Um, and a lot of these principles are based on that planning meeting that we had in October that are a result of the conversations that we had with you, our members, with our stakeholders um, that uh, are, are guiding how we're going to approach this, right? So the things that we need to stick to to remember in order to meet the objectives that we had just outlined. So one of the first is that as a national union catalog, the primary function to enable researchers to help researchers find pre-modern manuscripts in US collections, including non-manuscript, non-European manuscripts. And what I mean is that we're not a research tool, right? This is not gonna be a place that you're gonna be able to come and necessarily find all the information that you need to find about a particular manuscript but we're going to help you find that manuscript and find that information. Next, we're requiring minimal standards for data entry. So metadata that only identifies a manuscript's location in an institution will be sufficient. If that's all you have is to be able to have a statement that says, I've got a manuscript in our collection, that's enough to get your data into digital scriptorium. We also felt it's important that members manage their own manuscript metadata in their institutional format. And we will take whatever you give us, right? And we will put it into our platform. So we are not going to be asking you to support a MARC record and a digital scriptorium record. So we're, we're trying to remove that barrier. 
And then next, we're not going to host images. Images are expensive to host and maintain. And a lot of institutions around the country already have, for example, Penn makes all of its manuscript images available uh, on their open uh, repository. And so it's kind of redundant to have those different hosting platforms. For those of you, for those members who don't have a way to host images, there are a couple of options. One, you don't have to have images, right? If it's too expensive to do images, that's okay. You don't need the images to get in. Um, we're also committed to helping institutions look for hosting solutions, right? So we're, we're in conversation with Cornell University about the possibility of hosting the uh, legacy images, the images that are in Digital Scriptorium now uh, for those institutions that don't already have, that, that don't have an alternative. So we're, we're going to help you find solutions, right? This is gonna, gonna be part of the, the benefits of, of membership. Another thing that we wanna do, and this is sort of the linked open data bit, is we're gonna enhance the metadata that you give us with a name, uh, name place and a manuscript ID authority. So we're all actually in-house. We're gonna develop a, an authority management system that will um, allow us to uh, create authority records for names and places um, that don't exist in something like the Virtual International Authority file or in the Library of Congress name authorities and place authorities or in geonames. So we're gonna be managing this as part of the work. We also want to uh, create a manuscript ID number. And this number would uh, not replace a shelf mark, but would be in addition to a shelf mark, if the shelf marks are changeable, the manuscript ID number uh, would not be changeable and it would track that manuscript no matter where it goes. So how are we going to do this? And what I want to lay out just in the next few minutes is our, our basic vision of you know, our workflow, right? And Emma's going to go through the data model and this workflow in a little bit more detail. But I just want to sketch out a little bit what's going to happen. We want to take your structured data, right? No matter what format it's in, whether it's MARC or TEI or EAD, uh, you might have your own spreadsheet. You might use the Schoenberg database of manuscripts to create an inventory from which you can download that data into a spreadsheet or any number of ways, as long as it's structured. We're gonna convert that data for you into what, I'm gonna use the term agnostic transition spreadsheet. And this is a made up term by me, which means that we don't care how your data comes to us. It's just gonna go through this like spreadsheet that is gonna neutralize it so to speak. And then we're gonna transform your data into the DS 2.0 environment. And that transformation process, I'll let Emma talk about a little bit in more detail. And then once we've done that, we're gonna give it back to the world, right? This, all the data will be available through a public interface. Uh, we'll make the RDF available in the Sparkle endpoint and it will be free and open access. So when we're thinking about outcomes, um, there's some obvious ones. One, we want to be a National Union Catalog of Manuscripts in the US collections. That's the thing that we've been promising. We wanna be a management of manuscript authority records and identifiers for US manuscripts. And this uh, takes me to uh, the reason for this manuscript ID number is to participate, participate in projects um, like this one that has been developing in Europe for a while called ISME or International Standard Manuscript Identifier Number. And that's a project that Christoph Bluler and people at the ERHT um, are leading. I'm not sure where it is, where the progress is right now, but if they create something like that, we wanna be a part of it. We want our manuscripts in the US to be a part of that system. And so this will be, uh, you know, whatever happens to the European efforts, we will be ready to join in. We also wanna be a partner organization for member digitization and cataloging projects. So if you want to digitize your collection, we will work with you in an application to something like CLEAR or some other grant funding scheme or with donors 
to say that you know if you digitize the, your manuscripts, if, if if you can digitize your manuscripts, we can help you with the data. We can get, we can you know, be part of that uh, process of exposing your data to the world. We also want to be an access point for national and international partnerships involving U.S. manuscript data, and that's also going back to ISME and any other sort of projects that you know, we might think of post a DS 2.0 world. And then finally, one of the things that we wanna do is build a program to train catalogers and students and scholars in best practices for manuscript description. And we will talk more about that at the end. That's kind of a little tantalizing bit, um, but it's something that has, that we've just sort of really started thinking about. And so we're very excited about it. Um, I think now we can have time for discussion. If you have any questions about anything that I have just talked about before, Emma takes the, the wheel. Are there any questions? Nothing in the chat so far. So no, no major objections to anything I've said so far. <laughs> Great, I'm gonna take that as a good sign um, that I at least have your ear and hopefully the first step to, to being on board um, as we move forward. Emma, do you wanna? Um, it looks like Sydney posted a question. Okay. Does that mean that images that are currently hosted will be taken down? So images that are currently hosted, well, there, there are two things that will happen. Many of those uh, institutions belong to institutions that have an image repository, like PIN, like what I was talking about earlier. So we will probably take those down. For those institutions that don't have an option, you know, a, a local option, um, we are I mentioned that we are in conversation with Cornell University about the possibility of host of having Cornell host those images. Um, so that, so that we won't lose that content. Um, Emma's gonna talk about this more, but what our plan is that we'll have like DSC point will be a space where uh, you can access the images through something like Mirador, Redgeable IF server. Um, so we, what we have to do is find places that are triple IF compliant, which, which Cornell is. So in that respect, um, we won't be just you, you won't lose those access to those images. Well, Emma, do you want to move forward? I'll stop sharing yeah. my screen. Give it over to oh, you. Oh wait, we've got a we've got a question from John Overholt. Okay. Who says, do you you do I understand correctly that you're anticipating being able to take a library's catalog data in whatever form it's in and process it on the DS end that we won't need to do work on the data before we submit it? You will not be required to do work on your data. You are responsible for your data. So however you want your data to get put into DS 2.0, we'll take it. Um, but but we're, that, that's that's the, the deal is that you're not going to have to, um, you will not have to do anything to your data. You'll not have to do anything to your data. We might make recommendations to help get your data in the DS 2.0 in a, in a better way, but you don't have to do anything and we will take what we can get. And Ariel Bacon asks, is the plan to publish name, place, and manuscript IDs as linked data? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any more questions? All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Emma. Now I can see everybody's faces. Hi, everybody. All right. Um, 
Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the DS 2.0 data model. Um, and these are some of the principles that guided our data model development process. Um, Lynn mentioned a few of these already because they also guided our, our whole design process for the DS 2.0 project. Um, so we understand DS 2.0's primary function um, is to enable researchers to find pre-modern manuscripts in US collections. So we're not trying to produce a data set that is comprehensive about every data point about every manuscript. Um, our goal is to produce a data set that promotes access. Um, we also designed a model that includes minimal standards for data entry. So DS won't have any required fields. We've identified the most commonly found data fields and institutional catalog records to include in the DS 2.0 data model. And members are welcome to contribute as much or as little data as they desire. Members will also manage their own metadata in their own formats. We're going to use what you give us um, and we're not gonna correct or change it um, even if the metadata is incomplete. So for example, if you give us a bunch of records that are missing author information, we're not gonna go through and try to figure out um, authors to add to your records. Um, members are gonna be responsible for what they submit to DS. Now, what we will do is we will enhance the metadata through authority management, especially through names, places, and our in-house DS um, manuscript ID authorities. Authority management produces much more accurate search results, and we focus the DS 2.0 data model on fields that can be authority controlled. And one of the features we're most excited about is the unique manuscript identifier that we'll create for each manuscript at the time it is first entered into DS 2.0. Um, so here's a preview of the data fields that are going to be in the data model. And these are divided into three sections. So I'll start with the DS 2.0 information. And this is um, information about the DS record itself. So this is the, the DS ID, the unique manuscript identifier, and um, the date that the record was added and last updated. Um, this is really exciting because um, over the past year, we've been trying to figure out um, when all of the data was last updated in the current version of DS and the current database doesn't store any of that information. So we are um, really excited to add this to the DS 2.0 data model. We're also gonna be storing information about holding institutions. Um, so institutional ID numbers, including shelf marks. And we'll also link back to the holding institutions record if that's publicly, publicly available, um, like a mark record or things like that. And then on the right, you see all of the descriptive information we're going to include. That includes production place and dates, um, title, genre, subject, um, persons associated with the manuscript, language and material. Um, all of these will be authority controlled. And then we'll also have um, physical description notes and general notes about the manuscript um, and also uh, former owners. So we're going to be using linked open data to create DS 2.0. So I just wanna go over um, a little bit about what that means. So linked open data is a set of specifications for publishing structured data on the web. This data is designed to link to other data and that's where the term linked data comes from. It's designed to be processed by computers and um, it uses the RDF conceptual model, which I'll discuss in more detail on the next couple of slides. Linked data uses URIs, which stands for uniform resource identifiers to create stable links to information resources um, because URIs are um, unique and unambiguous uh, strings. And the end goal of linked open data is to turn the internet into one giant database, um, the semantic web, which you may have heard of. So um, the building block of linked data is the resource description framework or RDF. 
Um, and this is the basics of how that works. Um, the, the conceptual model is called a triple um, because it contains uh, three parts, a subject, a predicate, and an object. And if you're thinking this looks like a basic sentence structure in English, you're correct. Um, so you can think of the predicate as like a verb that does the work of linking one resource to another. So in DS, what a triple might look like um, is a DS 2.0 record linking to the title um, City of God, which is um, an authority file. So this is just one statement um, about one um, bit of data about something that's in DS. And the, the full data model that we'll look at in a minute will show you um, how all of the statements will be encoded. Um, so this very simple triple example, this is like a human readable version. So what the computer is actually going to process is a series of links. Um, so this is a made up example because we obviously don't have any DS 2.0 records yet, but this is what uh, a triple actually looks like to a computer. Um, each part is a web address and you can see how the structure allows you to link together resources across websites. So in this example, we're linking from a DS 2.0 record to the Dublin Core title property and then to the Library of Congress's authority file for Augustine City of God. So um, now that you understand the basic structure, let's look at the DS 2.0 data model. Um, and this might look um, overwhelming at first, but it's actually pretty simple um, once you get the basics for how to navigate it. So I'm going to walk you through this now. Um, so these patterns all, resent, all represent uh, triple patterns like the one that we just saw. Um, so you see here the DS 2.0 record. Um, this is where all of the descriptive information about a manuscript will be stored. So the data points coming off the DS 2.0 record include names, the title like we just saw, genre, subject, production place, language, dates, things like that. Um, all of these data fields represent information that is contributed to DS by members. So this is the data that will be refreshed on a regular basis and will change as institutions update their catalog records. So now I'm gonna zoom in on just this section involving name authorities to show you um, in more detail how, how the data model works. So every name associated with a DS record will be linked in this way and it will be managed um, by an authority file. So the authority record um, has five other triples coming off of it. Um, the heading, which is like the human readable standard version of the name. Um, the authority type, and this will indicate whether we're following BIAF or the Getty list of artist names or Wikidata or any other um, authority file. We'll have a link to the URI for that authority file. And we'll also link our names to places in our place authority. And this will allow us to provide geographic information for where institutions are located. And it will also let us indicate nas nationality and other types of associated places for persons. We'll have an actor type to indicate whether the name is um, an individual identity or a group identity like an organization or an institution. Um, and the, the actor record will also be able to indicate um, what role this person or institution played um, in the manuscript. So author, former owner, scribe, artist, things like that. Um, and these final boxes that you see at the end of these patterns um, all indicate what the, the value of the fields will be. So when you see the term literal, um, you can think literacy. So that's, um, that'll be something that you can read yourself. Um, and then the URIs are those unique uh, uniform resource identifiers um, that the computer uses to uh, process the data. 
Um, so you'll see the same um, sort of pattern for every blue box in the data model. And these are all um, authority files. Um, so now if we move um, up from the DS record, uh, we'll take a look at the manuscript information uh, and holding information. So we're just gonna zoom in up here. So the DS identifier will be connected to um, this manuscript record that's actually separate from the DS record. Um, and that's because the DS identifier is gonna be a permanent field that is not gonna be refreshed uh, in the same way that the descriptive fields will be refreshed. Um, and then uh, we also have holding information branching off from the manuscript. Um, the holding information relates to the DS member that contributes information about the manuscript. So in addition to um, an institutional authority record, we'll also link back to the institutional record. So for in many cases, this will be a MARC record. Um, we'll also store institutional IDs and shelf marks. We'll have start date and end date for when the institution um, began their possession of the manuscript, if we have that information. And we'll also indicate whether the institution is a current or a former holder. So this holding information is data that we will preserve long term. If a manuscript changes owners from one DS member to another, we'll create a new holding record for the new owner, but preserve the previous holding information as part of the manuscript's history in DS 2.0. Um, so that's basically the whole model, and I, I hope it's less intimidating now um, that we've walked through it. Um, it, it really is uh, pretty simple um, and will hopefully um, be appropriate for all of your uh, manuscript records. Um, and I just want to end here by talking a little bit about the technology that we've identified um, for our database software for DS 2.0 and that is Wikibase. Wikibase is an open source software that's used to create linked open data. It's what powers Wikidata, um, as well as any, many other linked open data projects in the cultural heritage sector, most notably Biblissima and the German National Library's authority files. One of the reasons it's so popular is because it's free, <laughs> so it's really gonna help our bottom line as we budget for the ongoing maintenance of this new system. But Wikibase also has a lot of other great functionality uh, besides its price that makes it a very appealing choice for us. Um, we'll be able to export our data in a ton of different formats. So we'll be able to share our data with other projects easily. It comes with a built-in Sparkle endpoint. Sparkle is the query language that is used to search um, RDF databases. Um, so this is an access point that more technical users can use to query our data and um, access the original RDF. Um, Wikibase also supports data reconciliation with an open refine plugin. And this will be really useful for us as we crosswalk data from a variety of institutional sources and harmonize all of these authority files. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, we're gonna start developing a prototype um, within the next month, I think. And um, we look forward to sharing some sample records with you later this summer. Um, and also um, just keep in mind that while Wikibase is um, going to be our database software, we will have a separate discovery interface for users to search and browse the data. So you don't need to understand um, anything about this technology or um, you don't need to learn Sparkle um, or even understand linked open data to, to use the S2.0. Um, and that is it for the data model explanation. So I'm happy to answer any questions.
Um, well, if there if there aren't any questions, that's great. Um, and uh, I will move on um, to our data contribution workflow. Um, so these were our two objectives um, that we kept in mind as we designed how we were gonna ingest data into DS 2.0. Um, we wanted to provide as low a barrier as possible for content contributors. Our goal is to accept data from all types of institutions on all pre-modern manuscripts, um, regardless of the size or scope of their collections or the size of their staffs. Um, you know, our dream is to one day have DS be the U national union catalog of the entire country. Um, so we really wanted to, to keep the barrier for contribution low. Emma, if as questions appear in the chat, do you want me to just jump in or shall we hold them? Um, no, I mean, let, let's let's address them now. OK, there are there are a few that have that have shown up now that people have had a few minutes to absorb everything. Uh, David De Lorenzo asks after the process, after the project is completed, who will be the technical support staff? Um, I think Lynn's going to go over more of the, the long term plans for um, for implementation. Um, oh, OK. Um, later on. So that may answer uh, Aaron Mack's question. How do you store the various ways that dates can be represented? We'll talk about that. Oh, yay. Oh, gosh. Well, dates normalizing are... dates. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh... dates are such a headache. Yes. Yeah. I read that question as data can be represented, and I was like, oh, that's e easy, but then it's dates, which is not easy. Um, no. And Doug, Doug Emery might be able to speak to that. Yeah, so we talked about a couple of different ways of doing this. On the Mapping Manuscript Migration Project, we would use a, uh, we would use a complex four-part data scheme uh, for the date. So you essentially you have, it allows you to have, that allows you to have a range if you need a range, which would begin with, would have a begin date and an end date. And then each one of those dates, the beginning date and the end date is actually represented by two, uh, is represented by two dates. So for instance, if you wanted to say that, it, that something happened in a range that took place, let's say between March of a certain year and December of a certain year, then you would represent, it provides a way of representing uh, the month of March as a beginning point and the end of, and, and the end of the year as a beginning point. Uh, so there, there are ways of managing that, but the short is, is that we would convert, um, we would convert the dates that we got into two basic formats. One would be some sort of structured format that would use a, a year month date uh, components and the other is that we would have uh, we're planning on having centuries as a separate date so that we can simply we can simply say this is a 13th century 14th century and so forth and Dan Gillow has two data questions and then I'll turn to Kivel's question uh, Dan asks if the data that's entered is unstructured unstructured and uncontrolled how can it guarantee to conform to the parameters needed for linked data properties and then he also asked if the system is going to support Unicode characters, diacritics, uh, punctuation from non-Roman character sets, um, and if bilingual entries will be allowed to respect native scripts. Yeah, so just to address the first question, we are not taking in unstructured and uncontrolled data, right? So, so your, your data has to be structured. The data that we take in has to be structured. Um, so you might have a mark record, for example, how this might work is if you have a mark record and you have an author field and a place field, but your provenance data is written in a note form that says so-and-so bought this at this sale, then another person bought it, blah, 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 but it's written as a paragraph. What we'll be able to take from that record is the author and the title and the production place, and we, could, we can import the provenance data as a note field, but but names associated, you know, former owners would not be represented 
former owners that are in that paragraph would not be represented in the structured data of DS 2.0. And, and that's okay, right? If that's how you want your data presented. Um, we're hoping that one of the outcomes is that we will start encouraging people to provide structured data for their manuscript description um, in a more sort of systematic way. Does that answer your question, Dan, Daniel? Yeah, it, it does. Um, it does. I think the, the the interesting part there, though, is that with notes in particular, if it's going to come in as a kind of a text block in a way, um, the, the data, of course, and the notes may not conform to authority controlled data because it's just the way it is. That's yeah, what. exactly. Well, especially <laughs> in a mark record where everything is just thrown into a 500 field. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but we're hoping that, you know, over time that, that people will change their digital manuscript description practices, right? Not manuscript description practices, but digital manuscript description practices. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to build in this training program is, you know, how to do that, right? So it may, you know, when DS 2.0 opens its doors, it may not look great, right? Like the data may be a little bit off in a way that you might, you know, you might expect it, a published resource to look sort of perfect and clean. Um, but over time and with continual refreshment, uh, we hope that that will be resolved somehow. And even if some data isn't um, imported, it will still appear in the host institution's record. So yeah. at least, you know, from Digital Scriptorium, you'll find it through the basic discoverability and then you'll link out to where the rest of the details are. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so your the host institution record can be as full as you want it to be. We're not telling yeah. you to limit your data to minimal description standards that we are asking for for the structured data. Um, but yeah, in order for this to work for your data to work well in this in the environment, we'll we'll need to have access to structured minimal data. And uh, Dan had another oh sorry, go ahead, Dan. Sorry. I, was, I think it's important to remember that we're not building a cataloging application. What we're doing oh, is done. we're building Sorry. an application that allows us to find manuscripts and is, is capable of accommodating some of the more significant types of data values. So there's a lot that you might say about a manuscript that we're not collecting. Like I don't think, for instance, we're, we, have a, we have fields for binding information that we're really focused on these the sort of the more salient pieces and and linking to richer sources, as uh, Lynn and Lisa were saying. Um, and then Dan had another question about diacritics and non-roving character sets. Short answer, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, back to Kivel, who asks, are unique IDs based on current Manuscripts, so specifically she's thinking about manuscripts that have been split and are in different repositories, can they be linked under a single identifier? Have we solved that problem of what happens when a manuscript input as a single identifier then becomes split in half? I think we won't. I mean, I don't want to say that we have solved this problem, like we have the solution, but our solution is the manuscript ID that we will give a manuscript an ID number as it is when it's entered into digital scriptorium, right? So if, it, if it's a fragment in the University of Kansas collection, that fragment will have its own ID number. If, that frag if a, another fragment appears in Penn's collection, that fragment will have its own ID numbers and there'll be ways to you know, link those Two numbers together so that you can see that they're part of the same manuscript. But but that's our solution. Um, but you're not well, in the you're not in the business of doing digital reconstructions, right? That's what fragmentarium uh, is for, or something else. Yeah, and and I know that this is, you know, I think part of the reasons why it's been difficult for the European um, group consortium to sort of move forward with ISME is because it, you know, this making these decisions is really hard. We're, we're gonna try out the easy approach and we'll see if it works. We'll see how it works. 
Um, Liz Teviadale had a question. Liz, do you want to just unmute yourself? I wasn't quite sure what you were getting at in the chat. Yeah, I was just uh, responding to or trying to visualize in the instance of, you know, these guest dates, which in current DS tend to be quarter centuries and half centuries, you know, the mid, late and all that. What I'm seeing or thought I understood is that all of those guest dates are just going to be a century. Could they be multiple centuries, I guess, is the next follow up. Were you going to say something, Lynn? I'm going to let you take okay. it. Okay. So I think that I think that what we'll we we in some ways we haven't worked out exactly how we're going to handle centuries, whether we'll have multiple centuries if there need to be multiple centuries. I think that's right. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lynn or Emma. But when it comes to but the point is is that there will be a numerically structured date that is also available for computational access. So we'll have both a text representation, but we'll also have uh, we'll have a we'll have a a, a strong a, as I'm saying a, a numerically structured date that we can use to compute the the relative time spans of different manuscripts or the precise the absolute uh, ordering of manuscripts for instance we wanted to sort on dates right so I think as it is now one can't tell whether what's being expressed is between this date and that date, because we know something about the content, which allows us to say it has to be after this date and before that date, as opposed to a late 12th century kind of guesstimate. And we, we would be able to do that sort of thing. I think it, it all depends on the quality of the data that we have coming in uh, and, and our ability to work with ability to enrich or work with that data that we're receiving. And I, I think like one thing that we might try to do, and we do this with the Schoenberg database. So if you've entered data in the Schoenberg data, da database, when you get to the date field, you have the date as recorded, which could be late 12th, early 13th century. It could be mid, you know, 1400s. So, you know, could, you can enter it exactly how the catalog describes it. And then there's... And then you put that date in and then there are date ranges that actually for most dates will automatically pop up numeric date ranges. And we have determined what those date ranges are for the Schoenberg database. And we, you know, researchers need to understand what those are. We, you know, put them up on the website, but they're, so like, for example, the, you know, if you say circa 1555, the date range is uh, 14, sorry, if you say circa 1445, the date range is 1435 and 1465, right? So you, we put 10 years on either side of that date. So you don't see that when you, when you look at a Schoenberg database record, you don't see that, but you can, but it makes it possible to search on those, you know, date ranges like anything that's sort of included in that date range. Uh, let's see. Oh. Um, so we've got a, a few questions from Mark Custer. Mark, do you want to unmute and just ask your questions directly? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I, guess, I guess both of my questions kind of um, boil down to the same, uh, just kind of yeah, questions around the, the data model. Um, one being, you know, the, the concept of the, the catalog record being an entity, I was, it seemed like that was kind of a central thing. And I just, um, just, yeah, just thinking in the RDF world, that there's, you know, you have to be very particular about what you're discussing. Um, and, and otherwise, you know, inference can have unintended consequences. So like just for, as an example of Library of Congress identifiers, they, they both They've had to mint um, identifiers both for the real world people as well as for the authority records because you know an authority record doesn't have something like a birth date. Um, it has a creation date, whereas you know it's actually the person who has a birth date. And so, like when you start using RDF, you have to be very particular about what you're talking about. And so, I just wasn't sure when I was looking at the um, uh, the data model pictures a few screens back. It seemed to me like that some of those fields should be pointing off of. Um, 
you know, the concept of the work record rather than the, um, the catalog mm -hmm. record, uh, like the person who, you know, created it. Um, and the other thing, yeah, I just wasn't sure about since, yeah, there's just, I just saw manuscript and holding. I, I didn't know if there was a need to fit in any more nuance about, um, uh, I guess, yeah, there isn't a work here, so it's just manuscript. So maybe there isn't a need for any more nuance in terms of if there's just a fragment that's described, would that just be called a manuscript in this um, instance? Do you want to take that, Doug? Yeah, so I think that for to answer your last question, a manuscript would be, a fragment would be a manuscript in this instance. So for us, a manuscript has a one-to-one -one correspondence between some object that exists in the physical world now. And the, the DS 2.0 record is a description of that manuscript, which is transient. So the manuscript is the is the is the persistent object. The holding information is information that may change about the location of that manuscript or the name of that the, the designation of that manuscript within an institution or from one institution to another if the manuscript should move. So uh, the intent here is to make a separation uh, between this persistent concept and transient pieces of information. In this case, the description that's a part of the DS 2.0 record that may change, for instance, from time to time or may, may change from one holding institution to another. The, one of the things that we've discussed, and I think that where we are stand right now, is that should we receive a new description of a manuscript that would have replaced the previous description of the manuscript while the manuscript itself persists? When it comes to, I'm not sure what you're asking about the, the relationship between works and, and authors. I think that one of the, I can say that one of the models that we have in mind here when we think about the data that's coming in because it's so prevalent is the, is the mark record. And in the mark record, you're presented with titles. However, they're presented in the mark record and you're presented with authors and other named uh, organizations or people. Uh, which have different types, and there may not be associations between them and, and strict associations between them. Is is that uh, addressing your your question, Mark? Yeah, kind of. I think I would maybe just need to engage a little bit more with the, the full data model. But what I was, you know, I guess the initial um, just concern about that, the focus there on that record part was, you know, the record itself has a creator who would be the cataloger. You know, it's not the creator of the manuscript. Um, and so that's where I was, um, and just wondering about what the rest of the ontology would say in uh, the digital, digital quorum, just making sure that um, all those RDF statements, you know, work together when uh, integrating with other uh, ontologies. So like with, yeah, CIDOC CDRM or something, it would be, you know, the human-made object is the, the thing that has a creator. Yeah, yeah uh, and I there's think that's... Also I was Go just going to say, th thanks. There's, there's also a difference between the technical services librarian who created the record itself and the manuscript bibliographer who actually did the cataloging work. Those are sometimes two different people, too. Yeah, yeah but in, just in general, yeah, I mean, I like this approach quite a bit. I was just, yeah, just, I just had some initial questions there about the, um, the main entities. I, I think uh, you raise a good question. Go ahead, Doug. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think you raise a good question about about the creator of the record versus the creator of of the object itself, and and I can't recall if we had that specific discussion, but this would be, uh, this is something that that we should have clear and certainly have clear at least in in our documentation of the present presentation of the model. Um, John Mark Ockerbloom has has asked something that I, I think Mark would also like, which is, is it possible to share this online, the data model, the draft data model, so people can dig into it a little, or is it not really ready for prime time? Um, I think we can share it, um, and this version is actually, um, I think Miko has made some adjustments, um, so this this may not be exactly current. Um, so it, it is a work in progress, um, but I think I can share um, share a copy of it, um, and I can do that after the meeting. Great, thank you. I think that's all the questions that have piled up so far. Thank you, Lisa. Should Great. we move on to the next bit?
yeah um let's see so um so i was talking about the the contribution workflow objectives and um I think where I left off was that we we wanted the content contributors, uh, we want the responsibility of the data to, to remain with the content contributors. So DS's role is going to be to aggregate information, but we're not responsible for the quality of the data that we receive. We're just gonna take what DS members give us. So the member responsibilities for DS 2.0 are gonna be uh, pretty straightforward. The first one is that you must maintain your membership in Digital Scriptorium, and whether that's at the full member level or um, at the associate level. And then you need to share your, your data with us on a regular basis. And we haven't decided how often regular updates should occur yet. Um, I imagine at least once a year, if not more. Um, and we will have a schedule where we request updates on your holdings. Um, so here's the proposed workflow. Um, members will provide the best quality data available in a structured format. And for many of you, that'll probably mean MARC records, but we can take um, really anything as long as it's not in a Word document. Um, as long as it's structured in some, some capacity. Um, so then DS staff will take your records and convert them um, against the DS 2.0 model um, into a transition spreadsheet, a CSV file um, that we will then use to upload the data into DS 2.0. So institutions won't be responsible for crosswalking your data um, into DS 2.0. Um, or getting your data into the DS spreadsheet. Um, the DS staff will take over ownership of that process. And we'll be able to do this because our implementation funding will allow us to actually have paid staff for DS um, throughout the, the grant. Um, and this doesn't mean that we may not come back to you and say um, your data's like in, you know, is not structured well, or there's there's some inconsistencies that we'd like you to iron out. Um, but we will take over um, the the main responsibility for um, converting your data. Um, so, in addition to converting um, the transition CSV into RDF and managing the whole data conversion process, um, we will have um, a lot of other staff responsibilities. We're going to assign and manage the manuscript ID authority, the unique DSID numbers um, that will be permanent identifiers. We will handle data reconciliation for all of the authority work. And most of you will be contributing records that already have some sort of authority control for certain fields, but it's unlikely that you'll all be using the same controlled vocabularies. So we will handle the reconciliation process and harmonize the data uh, to create our standardized DS 2.0 data set. Um, going along with the data harmonization, we will manage um, our authorities for names and places and contribute those as linked open data. We want every name and place in DS to be authority controlled, um, but due to the nature of, of some of the names, that means we'll, we'll be creating our own in-house authorities because um, especially for scribes and former owners, they're often not represented in outside authorities yet. So DS is going to produce these authority uh, files and make the records openly available for others to use. Um, we will also supply links back to DS member records and images if they're available. Um, as has been mentioned, we're not trying to replace or supersede institutional catalogs. We're, we're trying to provide a single access point. Um, so we always wanna provide links back to institutional records if they're available. Um, we'll also build and maintain a discovery interface um, with keyword and faceted searching. This is to give users an easy way to access the data. Um, we'll maintain and regularly update the DS 2.0 data. Um, and as I said, we'll, 
we'll determine an appropriate schedule for that um, later. Um, we will make the DS data available via the Sparkle endpoint. Um, Sparkle is uh, available for more technical users to access the data um, and query it in a more direct way than through the discovery interface. And it will also allow um, larger scale analysis of the data set as a whole. Um, we are planning to provide IIIF functionality via Mirador or um, similar software for image viewing within the DS 2.0 discovery interface. Um, and as Lynn mentioned, we're aware that um, many of our member institutions don't yet publish um, your images with IIIF and we're actively investigating hosting solutions um, for those of you who need help and we're committed to supporting our members in this way. Um, but also keep in mind that images aren't required to participate in DS 2.0. Um, and we'll also assist in hosting data transfers between holding members as needed. So if a manuscript changes owners from one DS member to another, we'll facilitate the transfer um, of that data within DS. And we'll also export the DS 2.0 data if the new owner would like to um, use our record as a starting off point for their own um, institutional records. Um, and then here are just a couple additional um, responsibilities that we're taking on that don't directly relate to data ingest. So we're, um, we're really hoping to collaborate with national and international partners. Um, and um, this doesn't mean that we will be um, seeking out and applying for research grants ourselves, but um, we want to, to work with DS members who wanna pursue these types of partnerships. And our management of the DS data will um, allow us to easily um, contribute data to international partnerships, um, such as the ISME project whenever uh, that materializes. Um, we also want to assist our members who don't have the resources to catalog or digitize their manuscripts. Um, Lynn is gonna speak a little bit more about this um, later on, but we've identified some funding options that would allow us to um, offer fellowships um, for cataloging or um, digitization that could be offered in tandem with our implementation work um, or after implementation is complete. Um, we will also be assigning the dated value to manuscripts that can be dated um, in support of the International Committee on Latin Paleographies project for dated manuscripts. Um, and this project is um, hoping to identify manuscripts that can be reliably dated to assist in paleographical research. research. And DS has already been identified as the contributor for manuscripts held in the US for this project. Um, but DS 2.0 will continue uh, the partnership with this group. Um, and finally, we are going to maintain the unique manuscript ID numbers, um, even if a manuscript leaves a DS member institution. So those IDs will be permanent um, and we will retain the DS ID along with the last holding information. Um, the information will be updated until um, either the new owner becomes a DS member or the manuscript um, moves, um, moves owners again and, and is part of, officially part of DS again. But we will preserve the DS ID um, and the last data update until that time. Um, so that, that's it for the contribution workflow. What questions are there? Kibble has, uh, Kibble has another question. What will happen if an institution doesn't host manuscript data or images on their own? For example, places like Conception Abbey in Missouri, which has 40 records in Digital Scriptorium. So in other words, what about the institutions for whom Digital Scriptorium is their online repository? So for those institutions, we will be crosswalking the current DS data. Um, into DS 2.0. Um, and the, the images will hopefully be hosted by another DS member institution. And we can provide them, you know, these institutions with this spreadsheet 
you know, so they can just sort of directly input the data. Mm -hmm. um, not to talk too much about the Schoenberg database, but you could actually, you know, you can do an inventory in the Schoenberg database. Um, contribute to that resource and have your data in there and also, you know, take it out and put it um, directly into the spreadsheet. It, would, it aligns very, this, the data that's in the Schoenberg database aligns very well. So there are multiple ways of, of doing this and we're not, you know, we don't want to leave anyone out, right? And I think, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't see too many obstacles. And Liz Teviotdale asks, what's envisioned in terms of pricing for membership in DS 2.0? Broadly speaking, how will it be different or similar to the current scheme? Um, there will be fees. We will continue a fee structure. Uh, what that looks like remains to be seen. That will be part of the work in the next couple of years. Um, so that, that's going to... that. We're going to have to really think that through, but we but what we first felt like we needed to do was make a case for you know membership, right? So like what what we're hoping to show that with this uh, presentation, you know, are the things that institution you know how institutions will benefit to justify membership fees. But it's that will be a long conversation that we will have with membership. Uh, Nick Herman coming to us live from his fabulous location, would like to know if there's a possibility of user comments or user curation, which would help flag errors or suggest attributions. I think there's a possibility, but what we want to encourage you to do is contact the institution directly, right? So, um, so for updates, you know, that's that's what I think we want people to do. Uh, let's see, user curated list. Um, that's something that could be possible in the public interface where you can, sort, you know, bookmark, I guess, mm. or the man, you know, the, the ones that you want to, to track. This is functionality again, like we have in the Schoenberg database, where you can watch record, you can bookmark, you can tag. So I imagine that we could do similar sorts of things in the interface. So people could create their own list, their own personal yeah. collection. That's good. Yeah. I don't see anything else. All right. Um, well, I'll stop sharing then and hand the screen over to Lynn. Okay. Sorry. All right, so in the last bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about our implementation plans and the timeline. Um, there are three uh, phases, I guess. We're in the planning year, right, which ends August 31st, 2021. That's when the IMLS grant officially ends. And then thanks to very generous contributions from some member institutions uh, through an effort led by DC Schroeder, a uh, DC di uh, Digital Scriptorium board member and treasurer, we are able to fund a bridge year so that on, on sorry, the planning year ends July 31st, so that on August 1st, we will be able to continue project management with Emma Thompson as the project manager. Um, and this is huge and we're very grateful to those, those institutions that have stepped up and, and I'll wait to publish an official uh, acknowledgement until things are finalized. But, but we're 99% we're sure that this is going to happen. Um, and then years two through four, so if this is, you know, after the planning year, if this is a four year plan, years two through four implementation and that is going to be either funded or it's not going to be funded. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute. But just to review in the planning year, what we hope to achieve by July 31st, 
apologies for the incorrect date. Um, the prototype built and trialed, the results of that trial data entry reviewed, and we're going to present the results uh, to membership, and we'll do that in July. In the bridge year, we want to begin beta testing the prototype. So depending on how things go with the trial, uh, we could begin uh, adding more data um, in early fall. And we're going to start with pen data because it's easy for us to access and the binary key library data uh, because it's also easy for us to access. And, um, and we'll just start with that sort of small data set. Uh, we'll put that through the pipeline and then we'll see what the results are. We'll also uh, do a crosswalk of DS 1.0, the legacy, what we're going to call the legacy data, into the DS 2.0 environment. We'll be, um, you know, I don't think that will be a very uh, complicated thing to do, but it might take some time. Uh, we're going to establish the data ingest workflow from the spreadsheet. So what we presented to you today is a proposal. Uh, we're going to see how that works and hopefully be able to confirm it or uh, tweak it as needed. We're also going to be performing name and place authority reconcili reconciliation in the test data and see how that works. And we'll develop the, the manuscript ID uh, management workflows. We're also going to submit um, to the IMLS National Leadership uh, for Libraries grant, uh, an implementation grant. Um, and that will, that's sort of a long process. So they haven't come out with the dates yet, but if it's like, if it was like the planning grant, uh, we can expect that sometime in October, we will submit a pre-proposal and that's a two page proposal that then goes through a process of review. And if that proposal is accepted, uh, you're invited to submit the complete proposal. And that could be around January, 2022. Uh, they notified us a week before they notified us in late July for an August 1st uh, start date. Um, which was okay, we're happy to get it, uh, but, but it, there is a long time between, um, you know, the, when you submit the application and uh, the notification, and then a very quick turnaround time if you're going to get funding, uh, the, the, the project would start like August 1st or September 1st. Um, and then if we don't get funding, obviously we will be able to sort of, we'll have to deal with it then. Um, you can request funding up to $1 million, but with a matching cost share. And so we have worked on some budgeting and uh, we have a sort of basic outline that amounts to something like $500 or $600,000. So it would be great if we could apply for a million dollars, but then we have to find matching cost shares for that a million, that, that amount, um, which, which is part of the challenge. But this is what, you know, Emma and I are, working on these considerations with Deborah and the, the rest of the board uh, to see how that might work. Um, Penn is the host of the planning grant uh, and it could be the host for the implementation grant or we could do it in partnership with other institutions or other institutions could take it over. That all sort of remains to be determined and we will do uh, what is best for DS2.0. So, I'm not sliding on advancing forward. So now we're going to move to implementation. And there's a question oh. about whether there will be if there's a plan for if we don't get funding. And yes, there is. But let me talk about what happens if we do get funded. Chat box. Um, so this would be a three-year plan, right? So in the second year of DS 2.0 development, the first year of grant funding, uh, we'll complete beta testing, we'll implement changes, we'll add more test data, we'll strengthen and build membership, and possibly at this time be able to build the public interface, which is not listed here. So in year three, we will be in a, situ in a position that we'll be able to take in data from member institutions will be in a position to assist members in creating and updating manuscript data, 
through a postdoctoral and graduate student fellowship program. So the idea is that we will, we will apply um, to the IMLS grant for fellowship and graduate student funding that will bring people in that can help, can go out to institutions, either physically or, you know, institutions can send images and help help institutions get their data ready um, and put in a format that we can take. Um, and as we do this, what we want to think about doing is develop a manuscript description training program. And we have been in conversations with the NEH Preservation and Access, the Office of Preservation and Access, and they have a training grant program that would absolutely fit into something like this. So in year three, uh, I'm not clear about the timing, but we might apply for this training grant. And then in the next year, in year four, we might have that training grant or we might get it the year following it. Um, so in year four, we would just continue adding member data. We're expecting this to be pretty labor intensive, uh, but with the help of postdocs and graduate students um, and with the experience that Emma and I bring to the project, we think that we can, we think that we can do this. Um, we might be able to implement an NEH funded manuscript description training program. That would be awesome. And then also in year four, we're gonna, after we have set CS 2.0 up and running. I think that might be a good time to review membership requirements and roles to support CS 2.0 beyond implementation. So we're gonna have to consider, so, you know, Berkeley has been the technical host and membership fees have gone to Berkeley to support WebGenDB. If we're using Wikibase, we don't have to pay for that, but there is, there are costs in terms of maintaining the data and also you know, just general technical support, but I don't think it will be as heavy as the load that Berkeley is carrying for the current DST. Then we'll have a better idea uh, as we move along in this, but that's that's what we're thinking now. So if we don't get funding, which is a possibility, but we think we're going to have an awesome proposal and we're super excited. But if we don't get funding, we think that we can still complete beta testing and implement changes, add more test data, but at a slower pace, right? So uh, this is, and this is where membership fees might uh, come into play. So we might be, able, you know, could we look to members um, to help us like, continue supporting the bridge year funding model uh, Will we need to increase membership fees? We don't know, but, but we are thinking about these problems right now. We think that we will be able to transfer data from members institutional catalogs, assuming that the beta testing in the bridge year goes well. We think that regardless of whether we get an IMLS grant, we will be able to develop the manuscript description training program and apply for the NEH grant. We will, we think that we will be able to continue adding and refreshing member data. And we will definitely be able to review membership requirements and roles to support DS 2.0 beyond implementation. So, so especially thanks to the bridge year funding, even if we don't get this grant, we are still in a position to do something to get DS 2.0 up and running. It just might take more time and it might take more member investment. And we hope that we are convincing you of the value of DS 2.0 so that when you have to go to uh, your administrators and say, you know, we would like to, we might need to uh, increase fees. Um, they'll see, you know, they'll see real benefits to joining this consortium. <clears throat> um, I had something else. We we'll also, we also have to promote more members, right? So, so maybe more people, more institutions will want to become members now that we have this new plan. And if the more institutions that we have paying fees, uh, the less chance we'll have, or you know, the better chance we have to not raise fees uh, from those people that are uh, members now. So a lot of it, you know, there's, there's a lot of gray here, but but we feel like this is a good plan and a reasonable plan and a sustainable plan. So 
So post implementation, um, whether we get funding or not, uh, we we do it's like the non funding uh, time, non funded timeline. We do think that we that continued management of DS 2.0 at a host institution to be determined with a dedicated full time project manager uh, is possible. Um, we're hoping that by choosing a platform like Wikibase, if uh, let's say, for example, Penn is the host institution for the next six years or however long, Penn decides to that it doesn't want to be the host institution. We're hoping that the transfer involves a change of or, or a transfer of login information, right? And maybe some administrative work, but but. It will be a lot easier than trying to like move WebGenDB from Berkeley to Columbia or WebGenDB from um, Penn. We want to continue growing membership. That will be that will always be a priority. That's a priority now, and we are actively uh, getting new memberships. And we'd like to acknowledge Princeton and Cornell as new members, and Wellesley, I believe. Uh, and we want to build, we want to continue building education programming for best practices and manuscript description in a digital age. And that's through, would ideally be through the NEH training grant. Um, and there's the link if you want to, um, to explore it a little bit further. Uh, but even if we don't get a grant, again, I think there could be enough interest among member institutions to support such a program if we think it's valuable. So that's all I have. Uh, about our implementation plans, and we're happy to take more questions and suggestions for anything that we might have left out that you think is important. Mark Custer notes that the training aspect is something he is very excited about. And hopefully, we'll be able to make that happen. I agree. I think that's really a, a huge service that digital scriptorium could provide is more training on bibliographic description of manuscripts and just sending sending students out into the wild to to catalog. It's very exciting. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think back to um, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, you know, Columbus Stewart's slide of monks going out in a little VW van and travel. That's it. We need a digital scriptorium van to travel the country. And I do want to acknowledge, Lisa, your work. I mean, one of the things that makes this makes doing DS 2.0 so easy is uh, the work that you and Melissa Conway have already done in sort of canvassing the country for manuscript collections, you know, with, with the update to the Derici census. And so, so that's an extremely huge piece of this that we didn't mention today, but, but it is like part of the underlying uh, groundwork for DS 2.0 to go forward. We don't have to do a lot of discovery work, in other words. Well, that's there, will, there will be discovery work, but yes, but most a lot of it's been done. Well, and you know, I think about what, what Liz Hebert is doing right now, traveling or literally traveling around the Midwest in a in a car, looking looking at small collections with uh, fragments and other other previously unknown uh, unknown bits and pieces. It's very exciting. Uh, David DiLorenzo asks, the digital scriptorium ball has been kicked around to several institutions in its lifetime. That's certainly true. Is there a reason why Berkeley cannot continue to be the host? Is Berkeley here? I don't want to speak for Berkeley directly. Is it David or Lynn? Well, so Berkeley has told us they don't want to host it anymore. Um, they might, you know, it could be that uh, it could be that they do, you know, they become the host of the new DS 2.0, but, but we have been told that the digital scriptorium that exists at Berkeley will no longer be supported. Um, so there, there is, a, Berkeley could be a host, just not in the way that it is now. David is here. Where is David? Hi, David. Did I, did I represent that correctly? Yeah, Lynn Grigsby would be the person really to speak to it, but I think that that, that sums it up well, I think. Any further questions or comments or 
things that we haven't thought about. This is just posted in the chat a link to the uh, to their update. Lynn, I don't if you saw my comment in the chat, I just want to mention, I think you have till mid to end of March for the IMLS implementation grant deadline, not January. Because remember, we were it's it's a oh, that's final. right. You get you get notified in January. And then yeah. yes, thank you. Thank you for because we were we were I have to I have to pat that's our right. stamina on the back a little bit because we were literally writing the grant last year when COVID shutdown happened. And we're looking true. at a March 30th deadline and we all panicked. I mean, the emails that flew around between among us were pretty funny yeah. um, now in retrospect, because we made the deadline. And also um, IMLS gave us like a two, everybody a two week extension because they realized how crazy it was for everybody to make the deadline. But yeah, so yeah, you, you don't have to get it done by January. And I have to thank my colleagues at the in the uh, Penn Library's business office for yeah yeah <laughs> doing that because that wasn't you can't just trot down to somebody's office when you're <laughs> not allowed to leave your um, right. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions or comments. Um, we just want to thank you for coming, for showing up. That's huge to have such a um, good and representative crowd to be here to listen to what our plans are. And it, it really um, uh, gives us hope that that, uh, that we can accomplish what we're setting out to do. So thank you all for, for spending your Friday afternoon listening to this proposal. Um, as Emma, Emma's just posted a link to the exit survey, and it would be very helpful if you could fill it out. It's very, <laughs> I think it's not a very complicated survey. Uh, so hopefully it won't take too much of your time. And could we email, uh, email out a link to the recording? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll get the recording up and uh, send it out, post it to our YouTube channel. Is that the plan, Emma? Yeah, um, and we have to produce um, captions before we can post it publicly. So it may be um, a week or two before that's up. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. I just want to say thank you to you guys, especially to Lynn and to Emma and to everybody at Penn for taking the vision that the board has been working on for really for six years and making it so tangible and so reachable and and i i really hope that everybody sees that what what we've done is tried what they've done is tried to create a model so that it, ds can really be inclusive we can get everybody in the threshold has been so high for so long for institutions to join that our membership is still we only have we have 37 institutions in ds out of a possible like 500 and so as, as wonderful as it is where, where DS is now, there's, there, there's so many institutions that aren't, um, aren't involved because the lift is just too heavy for them to get involved with DS and to contribute their records. And I really think that this new data model is gonna, is gonna overcome that obstacle <clears throat> really fast and, and really help lot, lots of institutions get in that aren't in now. And also, it's going to actually make DS more robust because it doesn't matter how much data you have in a database. If it's not structured, you can't find it, right? You can't search it. It's too messy. Or so you look under one, you have to read catalogers' minds and think of all the different ways they might name a certain person or identify a certain attribute of a manuscript. So um, the, I was at a meeting, at a IIIF meeting in um, Edinburgh a couple of years ago where one of the, one of the uh, librarians involved with Biblissimo or one of the programmer, I think it was a metadata librarian, had said that for trying to collocate all these records for Biblissimo, he had come up with like over 21 ways of naming Pliny the Younger, all from French libraries. 
And so that's the kind of thing that makes your data unsearchable. You have to think, okay, if I type in Pliny the Younger this way, is it Pliny common the Younger? Is it the Younger common Pliny? Is it written in Latin? Is it written in French? All these, you have to think of all those ways of searching when your data is not structured. And, and so that's where DS is now. Um, you know, I've given demonstrations about that, like search textualis and then search texture, you get completely different records. So anyway, I, I really think that uh, I'm hoping that part of the educational effort of teaching people how to catalog is to, is to understand that you can use far more structured data, even in MARC records than we've uh, customarily used and tr traditionally used, and that all of this is going to be better for cataloging manuscripts in general for helping us all find and share what we know about manuscript collections in America. So anyway, thank you so much. Everybody give Lynn a silent, Lynn and Emma and everybody a pen. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to uh, all of you. And thanks everybody for showing up as you always do. You guys are awesome about showing up. And thanks for your leadership, Deborah. We want it, none of us would be here right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're very I'm welcome. It's been my my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, right. guys. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your Fridays and weekends. Bye-bye.